I just, I just talk to them. You see, call night, I call here, talk to them. I, I show them enough love and respect, cause they know what spot they bring me from. You know, understand? And I ain't disrespecting them, but you know, boy, I kick the calabash and they so wrong here, you know. My name is Ross Isaiah Burnett. I'm a Calabash artist and I've been doing this work for I can't put numbers to it now. I've been doing it for quite some time and I I love it. It, it comes like eating food for me. I, it just comes like natural. If you tell me right now this minute to go and get you a Calabash, I can go there, harvest it and prepare it and have you ready for you when you're ready to leave. Guaranteed. That's the level that I, I, I am at. True thing. I'm, I'm Dr. Anthony Richards, and we're here to talk about calabashes, different types of calabash, an important part of the culture of bygone Barbados. Um, what's a calabash? Well, You'd think that would be a simple question. Most people probably come across a calabash, something like this. Right? This is a maraca, a musical instrument. Yeah. Um, and people from another generation might have come across calabash looking like this. Right? Uh, today you might see an African uh, priest pouring libations right, from the calabash. Right, and uh, chanting, or a Rasta man might uh, eat from a calabash bowl. So um, it's not completely unfamiliar. From a, a youngster, right, I was not really painting, painting, but I was always interested in art from primary school. I, most of my influence was from primary school. My first influence was from primary school where I had some, some older guys who used to come and teach art. Not teach art, teach, 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 but would draw on the board and I would just try to imitate right, what, what they were doing, right? That's how my interest started. I'm going to be speaking about the history mainly of calabash that we have in Barbados. Or calabashes, as we say. The uses and some of those kind of things, historical ideas um, from uh, us here in Barbados and how we use them and what we use them for and things like that. Well, I, I somehow suspect that this year all started way back in primary school, right? I remember entering a piece that I did and it was so good that they took it to the museum. They did. So I I remember being um, an artist from then. <laughs> and that was eons ago. <laughs> My interest in Calabash first was peaked on a visit to Raspael's in Foster Hall in St. John. I remember visiting Ayel's home we just, we, my wife and I, we are just, we are just went, you know, to pay him a visit. And he took us on a tour of his property then. And one of the things that he had there was a calabash tree. And he proceeded to pick a calabash, cut it, clean it, and dip some water from his spring because he has a spring at his place as well and gave us the drink. And I was so fascinated from then till now. <laughs> so that's what piqued my interest in the Calabash. Um, we've chosen to be here uh, in the cemetery, the military cemetery uh, in Bridgetown, Barbados, not far from the Hilton Hotel, it's just over there, uh, because we have 
three fine examples of calabash trees here in the cemetery. One of them is actually right here behind me. A beautiful small green tree um, which produces one of the most commonly known types of calabash in the Caribbean. Um, this tree has the scientific name Crescentia cuhute, right? Crescentia sort of like crescent or crest, right? Cuhute. Um, it's a native tree, so when the Europeans arrived, um, Christopher Columbus and others, they would have found that tree growing here, and um, it was already known to the native peoples. The, the Native Americans here, the Amerindians, or Kalinago and Taino. I had an idea, I had an idea back about, maybe about 20 years ago, to get a piece of land, just as I did here, select, have a select group of calabash and start a calabash farm. Start a whole calabash industry, right? Where we, we grow our calabash, we harvest them, we juice if we, if we get to that stage where we're juicing them, we're using the leaves, we're using the, we're using the bark, we're using the wood, we're using the entire, because it, the entire tree is useful. It is not just the fruit, okay? So we would start a whole industry with the calabash. And it's very, very possible. It's still very, very possible. Some people is need an incentive, right? My incentive for me at the time was to feed my family. You understand? And I don't think nothing would drive a man even harder, you know? than to go and look for food for your family. So that was my incentive, that was my motivation at the time to make sure that my family eat. We have two very different families <clears throat> and they don't crossbreed. They don't interact with each other in any way. So the diversity of shapes that you see here is not through interbreeding between the two classes of, 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 of calabash and gourd. Okay? The first type, this one over here, grows on a tree, the calabash tree that we're familiar with. Now, in, in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, this was found growing here and being used by the Caribs, the Kalinago, the native um, Taino. Uh, this would have been used for their vessels and for the ritual uses. And it grows up a tree, a tree with a trunk, a woody trunk. <clears throat> Over here, you have the calabash or gourd again, but this belongs to the pumpkin family, the squash family. In, in Barbados, this is called a marrow, okay? And it belongs to this family, the pumpkin family, the butternut squash family, the cucumber. This is the African bottle gourd called in Barbados the marrow. And um, in Africa, it is the principal calabash gourd used to make instruments like these. This is the shakere. If you were to read a book on medicinal herbs of the Caribbean or Africa and it said to you that the pulp of the calabash is used to treat such and such a disease, you would need to know which plant it was because otherwise you might find something that was not useful and something that might be terribly harmful. So it's very important to know this difference. It seems trivial, it seems overly scientific perhaps, but it does matter. If you go back, um, move around the Caribbean uh, to say the Maroons in Suriname, the Saramaca Maroons, right? they use both of these, but they have different names in their languages for these and they use them in very different ways 
and they prepare them in very different ways. So it is only people who are using European languages that are stuck with the confusion between Gord and Calabash. Now, which is native to the Caribbean? I said earlier that the Calabash that grows on trees is native to the Americas, is native to the Americas. And uh, it, it played a part in their cosmology as well as being of practical use. Now the African bottle gourd made its way across the Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean and established itself here long before the European arrival, right? Tens of thousands of years and there is still some debate as to how it got here. Many people believe that, scientists believe that the dried one may have floated across the ocean and established itself here. But certainly human beings, once they started to cross the Atlantic on a regular basis, also reintroduced it many times. So it can now be found throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout the Caribbean and the Americas. Well, I, I learned, in fact, a lot of it from Dr. Tony Richards, but a lot about the, the variant which will be from, from the vine, a gourd, that's what they call it, a gourd. And they can grow very long and slender, and so, so they don't really have the, the shape like a utensil, like how the ones from the trees have, right? So a lot of them are used mainly, you know, for just ornamentals, and things like that. But the the tree, and then again, it comes uh, so many different sizes, but we don't get the really big ones that they use like in Mali, um, places like that. They, they have some huge uh, calabashes that they do a lot of carving and stuff on, and you know, for bringing green and things like that. So I hope I've helped to clarify a little bit of the Two, the differences between the two types of calabashes and gourds. They're both called calabashes and gourds. One grows up in a tree and the other one creeps along the ground. This one, as we've heard, is Crescentia cujute, right? Or, or Crescentia cujute, right? This is Lagenaria, the bottle gourd, which is uh, indigenous to Africa, but made its way to the Caribbean long, long ago. Okay. The People's Art Movement, the APAM, was all started from the same St. Leonard School with the artist there, and then Omwali, he, was the, he, he coordinated the whole thing. And we used to go around the island and do some paintings, drawings, paintings. And had a lot, a lot of different interests. And we, have, we had some, some good people that we were interested in, in their palm. But it all started with us as young people. A lot of artists developed themselves from, from, that, from that period. And some of the leading artists on the island was, was, a, 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 was, a mem was membership, had membership in, in their palm. I'm a living example. I raised my children off of Calabash. I was a man, I tell you, I used to get up in the morning, head out in the countryside, whether it be St. Philip, St. John, what part I going, I know I going looking for Calabash. You understand? And I ain't coming back home empty hearted, because if I come home empty hearted, it means that them ain't going to get nothing. So. I get up in the morning and I go on out and hunt. I come home with some calabash. I can cut them, I can clean them out, I can prepare them, and I'm looking for something off of them. I can take my time, I can carve them, and I can go and I can present them, and hopefully somebody can give me a sale that I can get signed. Over time, that I, I, I find that the, the the calabash, the, the, the texture, the look. When I just look at the fruit, just seeing it, right, I can tell you, yeah, 
that's gonna give me a good color when it actually dries down yeah just looking at it I can tell you yes I know for a fact this is it and that was how I was able to select all the braids that I have here because over time I get to learn that you know just from looking at them I this is the one that I want and I used to go out and actually head them in okay I used to travel all over Barbados right take a crocus bag fill it with calabash throw them on my head and head to home so after a while that became very tiresome so I said the best thing to do is select all that you need and plant them and that is what I have done I've selected all the different species that I like to work with and I've planted them and I no longer have to go out I've been carving calabash for about 15 years or so I was self-taught but they had a, a lot of influence from seeing people work, right? Most of us get influence from seeing people work and wanted to um, express myself. I just developed the techniques and just kept on working with them till eventually I was competent in what I was doing and just kept on doing it. Wherever you travel, as I said earlier, wherever you travel, you see a Rasta man, you're going to see the Calabash because it's part of the culture. That's part of me. And, and, and your culture, you can't hide from it, you can't run from it, you can't get away from it. So how can you hide from it? You can't hide from yourself. Greetings everyone, um, today we're going to do a demonstration for you making a Morocco and we're going to select a fruit off the tree and proceed to do what we actually do best and that's make a Morocco for you. I've seen one that I know for sure will work perfect for us. There it is. here we're going to machine okay I'm gonna proceed to do the first portion of making the Morocco so we have our fruit as you can see um, no holes so we're gonna make an incision so that we can clean this fruit up. There it is, in. This is the technique that I use for cleaning to make a Morocco. Want to get all this so there you see have your hole Now we're gonna go in, start to take it out. Put 
let's just turn this machine off for the time being so that we can do this And this actually takes a while. As a matter of fact, cleaning this is gonna take at least three days. It's a process. You clean, you examine it, and you come back and you clean it again just to make sure that everything is out and there's no smell. That's one of the things that you gotta make sure there's no smell. When you've actually finished cleaning the calabash and you assemble it, you don't want a fragrance coming from it. Otherwise you have problems. You're gonna get sour flies, you're gonna get maggots, and you don't want that to be happening to your fruit. So you're gonna make sure that you clean this for at least three days. You might be wondering what kind of knife I'm using to clean the calabash. But this is actually a piece of metal rod. Just a, a piece of metal that I fashioned it into this fancy shape at the end. I don't know if you can see it. It goes all the way inside and it scoops everything out really nice and clean. So from here now, I'm actually going to shake it out. So I'm going to shift my position from here. I'm going to move over here and do a bit of shaking. All right? There you go, complete, fully clean. If you notice, I've changed the bit. I've changed down to a quarter inch bit now, and I'm gonna bore a hole on the reverse side of the first hole that I bored, all right? I guess you can hear that, right? That thunder in the background. You gotta make sure that you get this correct. If you don't get this right, it's gonna be out of line. So you need to make sure that you get it directly center to the opposite hole. And what this allows to happen, this actually allows air to pass through and completely dry the inside of the fruit because if it was only one hole no air would be able to pass through right so this allows air to go in circulate and come back out and dries the entire thing in on the inside so there you have it completely clean and two holes on both sides so there it is friends the first hole your second hole complete what we are ready for now is your handle okay folks here we have it now we have your calabash completely cleaned ready to go and what I have here is a 5-8 double 5 double you can get from any hardware store. I normally would not use um, a double. I would probably go out in creation somewhere and harvest some um, some wood from out there. But for for this purpose, I'm using a 5 double. You can get this from any hardware store. And this is what we're gonna use for our handle. So from here, all we're gonna do, you're gonna shave the top of the stick to make it fit inside our quarter inch hole. And that's what we're gonna do now. Wow, 
what we have here now is your finished handle but before I attach the handle let me just show you this piece of tool that I have here which is an old cutlass I cut the back end off of it the handle part and I fashioned it into this knife that I use for my shaving I'm using an old cutlass handle but you can use any sharp knife or any sharp object that you might have um, one of the good things that I find to do this with is a, a block plane a block plane works perfect for this stick there you have it what I normally do I measure my full wrist and then I add another inch or two and that's where I cut so that is the point that I'm gonna cut off and that is gonna be your Morocco and handle.